today. I heard yesterday was a tremendous blessing. Amen. Okay. And that's a blessing. Amen. Anybody else got a blessing? Yes. This is Kalidia. Kalitia. Kaliti. F or T? Kalitia. Tia or Kalithia. I'll get it eventually. We're yes, we're very blessed to have her this morning. Anybody else got a blessing? Yes. I'm blessed that my grandson is with me for two days. Amen. Happy about that. And I think he told you that we have another presenter singer. And now I'm not able to pronounce her name because I used to be easy to pronounce her name, then I'll have the name. All I know is Samuel's um Samuel's mom? Mom that was on the worship team at our other church. I didn't know that. Oh my goodness. Javius, I pray for you every day. You know why? You gave me a picture of you and your bestest friend as a memorial after his passing. And it's right next to where I do the dishes every day. And I thank you every day for sharing that with me. So thank you so much. And I, and I pray for you every day. And I pray for his family because of your faithfulness. Anybody else got a blessing? Yes. Yesterday, Angie and I went and we uh, helped. We always helped on the festival every year, the Roots Festival. And we had a speaker turn all together. We were close to 300. Woohoo! Good. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Yes, Davius. Well, we're happy to see your smiling face. What a blessing. I, I work all year long, and I don't get a vacation. Vacation would be Christmas, Thanksgiving, yeah. and Easter Day. But other than that, I don't get a break. And I know I missed the thing yesterday, but I had an opportunity to go down and hike my very favorite place to hike yesterday. 
So in the dark, yesterday morning, we left to go down to Watkins Glen. On the way down there, my friend announces, I don't know if I can do this hike. I'm like, really? Really? We're driving two and a half hours and when we got there, she goes, it's been 13 years since I did this with you. Now, Watkins Glen is a gulf. The last 180 stairs take you to the top. But before you get to those 180 stairs, you go up 836 stairs, not including all the walking in between the stairs. Do you understand why she was saying, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if my knees can do this. You understand that. So I was like, okay, we need a miracle, God. You know, he was bigger than any mountain that she could see yesterday because when we got all the way to the top, and, I, and the plan was, if she can't do those last 180 steps up Jacob's ladder, I understand that. And I figured, well, she'll sit down here and I'll go to the top. She goes, I need to use the bathroom. I'm like, really? You got to go up those last 180 steps then. <laughs> but it was a blessing. She did fine. She came home, soaked in a tub, you know, used the remote the rest of the day. But, she, you know, sometimes we think, there's no way this body's going to do whatever's set in front of me today. Guess what? Jesus can do it. Yes, Ruthie. Yeah, yeah. Until you sell, and my daughter looked out and go, "Who is that?" I don't know the right name for this. It's an African macaw. We got the the head resin uh -huh. type thing. Uh huh. And he's he was Caucasian. My son-in-law. He walked down the sidewalk with his African with his with the, the, the Oh my head. goodness. He had water there. She's like, "Oh my God!" And but then at his funeral, he died very early, age forty-eight, of a heart attack. He got his family. And the funeral people kept saying, "You know what? I really do like Chris. I really want to enjoy life." Amen. He really cared when people are making fun of him. He bought this outfit. He, he loved it. And, but it's, sometimes it's, it's, it's bad that a tragedy, someone else's tragedy, make us change. Because that person, I hate to think he died for that reason. That wasn't the reason why he died. Right. Every time I think about James, he's like seven or eight months, I think about Katie's family. Uh -huh. He's never coming back. She won't see him. Yep. You know, I don't even know if she's a Christian, but um, I think I, I, that's what I measure everything by. I said, You know, it's garage sale season, and um, and we we had a big youth group that we were that we were all working together with, and they decided to have a garage sale. Now, ladies, that means that all your junk that you want to get rid of goes to the garage sale. So I'm unloading all this stuff out to the front yard of her house. I go inside to finish help getting stuff set up for the garage sale, and doesn't my oldest son come in the front door toting the, the uh, typewriter that has been sitting in the back of my closet since my mom gave it to me 20 years earlier than that. Now, he's almost 50, so, and he was like, 13 then. Mom, look what I just bought at this garage shield. I'm like, no way, no way, I can't get rid of that for nothing. <laughs> you know, so, you know, sometimes. I remember my oldest son, they used to have uh, canned goods drives through the post office, put it in the mailbox. Right. It was hanging on the mailbox, and um, they would say, someone left us some food, and they had already left. Somebody left us some food, Mama. Yep, yep, that would have been my kid too. Anybody else got something to share this morning? No? You know? Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing.
I've been spending a lot more time lately with the 13, you know, young teen crowd lately. And I've been brought home to the reality that time doesn't change a whole lot. Because I remember when I was that age, and maybe things were easier for some of you, but I found that that 12 to 14, 12 to 15 age was probably the worst times of my life as far as emotional stuff. And, and I don't know if I should share this, but I'm going to. It got to the point where I said, the world would be a whole lot better without me. And I, and I decided I would take care of that. When I woke up the next morning and I wasn't dead, I was like, I got to change something. I got to change something. And I decided that day that from here on in, if I, if I only live till I'm 15, fine. But you know what? I don't like the way things are. And so from now on, every morning, I'm going to find something to be thankful for. Something. And I can remember riding, the, remember riding that school bus to school in the morning, and it's freezing. And you can't even see out the window and stuff. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you, God. I didn't know Jesus as my personal savior yet. Thank you, God. And I'd think of something that was a blessing to me in that morning. So I don't care if you're 12 or 13 or you're 72 and find yourself in a place where you feel useless because I'm dealing with that aspect at home. My husband's shoulder is down here now. His one that he had done is down here. Um, or if you are a young teen girl and all those hormones are changing and you just, you just can't do it. Find something to be thankful for. Amen? Jesus died on a cross. You know what? He was thankful for it. He was thankful that he had an opportunity to do something good for the world. Now that doesn't sound like something good, does it? What did it do for us? It gave me eternal life. It gave me hope. It gave me peace. It gave me courage. It gave me a, a destination to go. Think about what it has meant for you. Amen? When I serve Bless your name. 
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice you've given us. We thank you for the eternal hope you've given us. We thank you for the positive road you've got for us, Lord. We thank you that you are there in the valleys. You're there on top of the mountains when we didn't think we'd make it. You're there every single day for us, Lord, and we ask you to be with us and meet our needs in the midst of this service and encourage us to stay. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. We light this candle. every Sunday to honor our military and missionaries. I thought I would read a few Bible verses on how God protects these special people. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Psalm 91, 1, verse 1 and 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Let us pray. Dear God, we pray that you will keep our soldiers and missionaries safe as they are off in foreign lands or close to home. 
They are in need of your protection. We ask that you keep them from harm and let them be successful in their duties. We pray all these things in your most holy name. Amen. Again. Please check our bolt in. All right, now we'll go to the next one. Uh, Tuesdays, we have our senior citizens uh, get together from 11 to 1. Uh, please let Roger know if you're coming. Uh, Wednesdays, we have our prayer time and Bible study that starts at 645. Uh, prayer time. Uh, please, if you have a prayer, because like I say, we bring a lot of things up on Sundays and we forget come Monday, or uh, come Wednesday to pray. So, take time to jot it down so Wednesday when we do our prayer time, we'll, uh, we'll be able to say a prayer for whatever's going on. And uh, don't forget, you can write praises on there also. You know, like our get-together with 300 people, our grandson here. Write that stuff down too, because I don't think God only wants to hear our prayers. I think he wants to hear our praises, too. Uh, we have our Board of Elders meeting after service. Next week, it's Romans, justified by faith. Don't forget our baby bottles. I think somebody said last week they were all taken out. We're just waiting for them to come back. I don't know. Have they had this picnic yet? Have they had this senior picnic yet? Two weeks from now. All right. Oh, the offering now. Is there any other announcements? If I could have two gentlemen please come forward. You know, giving is not really giving at all. The truth of the matter is, you're giving what God already gave you. So you're just passing it on. So please keep that in mind as you give today. I want to read out of the, read Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power and the works in us, to him the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this offering, and I pray, Lord, that you'd bless it and use it according to your will. I pray that you bless every single person here. And that you be with them here and as they go out. I thank you, Jesus, in your gracious name. Amen. Oh.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I would say it's turned on now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I want to say a special thanks for somebody or some people that I don't think get thanked very often, and that's our singers that are up here and our musicians. We don't say thank you very often, but I think that that our hymn singing in the morning, starting off our service, is a real blessing that we don't usually say thanks for. So, thank you. All of you that partake in that, I enjoy it a lot myself, and I know so do a lot of other people, and it's a way to get us thinking about what an incredible God we have. All the things that he does for us. And of course, when Mary asked for you guys to mention things that are happening in your lives, how God is blessing you, that's another one that really can be a special blessing to everybody else listening. When we pay attention, we realize it's done a lot for whoever it is speaking up, and then it makes us stop and think of what God has done for us. So that's a blessing in itself, too. All right. Today we're going to be in Romans, and we're going to be in the last half of chapter 3. So we'll be taking a look at some things there. You can be turning there while I talk about a few other things. The baby bubble bottle boomerang. <laughs> that turns into a tongue twister if I'm not careful. Okay. That um, the bottles that we had collected and were back there have been returned to uh, CareNet. If you, there are still any out that haven't been brought in, I'll be glad to take them in. But I want to thank you all for your participation in that, and I know CareNet enjoy, is very pleased to have that support. The other things that are on my mind, well, there's been a lot happening in our church family in the last several weeks. Um, between funerals and people that are getting diagnoses that are not too good and just plain illnesses and everything else, we've had a lot going on. We've had a lot of good things too. Don't get me wrong, I'm never going to downplay the fact that God has blessed us in all kinds of ways. But it is true that we have things on our heart and minds, and I hope you're all remembering to pray for each other. I'm going to mention a few in a few minutes. In fact, why don't we do it right now? Um, look around. Who's not here? Kyle. Kyle is not here. How come? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, That has always been a mystery to me because I know it, I, I've driven by it those times once in a while. And I look in the parking lot's got a line all the way. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Who goes out to eat at 1 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> so, yeah, he has some late nights because not only is he working until they close, but then there's all the stuff that has to be done after that. I understand that one. Work can be a, um, how am I going to word this? We all appreciate the jobs that we have. They keep our families going, they keep us going, but they can interfere with other things sometimes. <laughs> and that we have to deal with. Who else is not here? Look around. Sharon. Ah, Sharon is not here? Hmm. I'm seeing somebody back there. <laughs> That's okay. I've been able, I've been known to make that mistake. I even once mentioned somebody who was sitting right there that is being absent. <laughs> oh well. Marietta is not here. I think most of you know she is in Florida. Actually, should have be arriving there today. I guess she left yesterday. Um, say again? Yeah. We'll get to Debbie in just a second. Let me finish with what I was going to say about Marietta. She is 
spending two, three weeks, I think, in Florida with her son and family and using that time to decide what she's going to do about whether or not to have cancer surgery. So she needs our prayer in a couple of ways, for a good visit with the family down there and for wisdom and God's direction on what to do next. Debbie is not here. I don't know why. Does anybody else? I'll have to give her a call. I know that when I talked to her last week, things were pretty good. She's still having some pain. She's still not all the way back better, but she's doing was doing good at that point. I better mention also Barb and Charlie. I expected to see them. Um, because when I talked to them earlier in the week, she said they were going to be coming, driving themselves this time. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have my question about whether or not that's a good idea. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Charlie, I don't know if he's really should be driving now or not, but he apparently does okay short distances, so... But I'll have to find out why they didn't actually make it. They, I tried calling them twice this morning, but no answers, so. Bob is still having a number of problems, both with the headaches that he been having and with the flashbacks that the doctor has finally labeled PTSD. So he said earlier that he would not make it today. Um, and doesn't know quite what he's going to do because the doctors don't seem to be coming up with much of any help at this point. But he's still, they're still doing, I understand, they're still going to be doing some more testing in the next few weeks. So, prayer for wisdom for the doctors and for him. Linda Dasno has family visiting today, and so she's spending some time with them. Um, that's a good thing. One of those few things where I, okay, that's a good excuse for not being here, I guess. <laughs> you know me, when I prefer you to be in church whenever you can, but family is our first earthly priority. So, Yeah, Linda is still having problems with pain um, and getting, that's the right way, right way to describe it, just doesn't know how to keep on going because she's having, it doesn't seem like it ever ends, you know. you Some of you know that feeling very well. But uh, she needs to, de to come to the, to the conclusion that everything ends sooner or later. Nothing on this earth is permanent. Nothing earthly is permanent. But the other thing is that God has it all in his plan. He has a purpose. I've got another man who is really very frustrated. Let me just tell you how to, I think of this guy. He's going through life. He's married. He's taking care of his work. He's taking care of his wife. But he feels like he has no purpose. He doesn't like his job. He doesn't like his physical situation. He can't do the job he wants to do because of a physical impairment. The job that he trained for all his life. And now he feels at loose ends, sort of. And he's very discouraged and a little depressed. And again, my best answer for that is the same as I've said to some of you guys at other times. If you're still here on this earth, God has something for you to do. He wrote your story. He has a great end in mind. Don't you love that verse that says that he is, he knows, that God knows the thoughts that he has of you, thoughts of good and not of evil, thoughts of bringing you to a desired end. In other words, he's got something planned for you that is great, but you're still in the process. And you have to go through that. Recognize that every day, God has a purpose for your life. What does he want from you today? What can you do for him today? And it may be something very little, but that's okay. It isn't little in the eyes of those that you help. 
you seldom realize what a blessing you are to other people. I was reminded of that again. Jeannie was mentioned at Mike's funeral yesterday. And most of the stuff people are talking about were little things that he did along the way. But they were important because they mattered to the person that he helped. That's the way it is with you guys. I see you over and over again. I see you doing just some little gesture to help somebody. And you don't think of it as being anything special. And to you, maybe it's not a big thing. But to the person you're helping, it is. It's special. And you know what? In God's eyes, that's really special. It's you being his hands and his work in this world. And there's a promised reward. Terry's not here. Terry is another one that is getting discouraged. He called me today, or called, um, sent a message on the computer, that um, he wasn't going to make it today. Because his phone died and he can't afford another one and he can't get in touch with anybody, etc. He's also, the last time I communicated with him, very upset about his continuing problems with his landlady in the place where he's living. That she's just not repairing things. And she's blaming him for her problems with uh, code enforcement. Well, he did call them in once. But it seems like they've been in there into several of the apartments that she has recently. And she's trying to say that he got it all started. So he's very frustrated with his living situation and with his, uh, with his job and with other things. And he's letting that get him down. So once again, prayers for him to recognize God's blessings, not just look at the hard parts, things that aren't going our way. It, it, that's, it's our human nature to look at everything that we don't like, everything that looks bad to us, and to concentrate on that rather than look at the blessings that God gives. Don't you know that? It's, it, it keep, I'm sure all of you know the song, Count Your Blessings. I love that one because it exactly says what I'm thinking about here, that you need to stop focusing on the hard parts and look at what God has done for you. And man, when you do that, <laughs> if you just start making a little list, what am I happy for that God has done for me today? And you meant you never get to the end of the list because you keep thinking of things. <laughs> That's the way God is. And yet we, as human beings, with that human nature of ours, love to look at everything that isn't just the way we want it. I mean, is that everybody? Let me look around. I think we may have got everybody. That's enough. <laughs> She's downstairs. Downstairs with the kids. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thankfully, and glad to see them today. Um, he's been away for Sunday um, preaching, and I'm glad that he's back again. Nice to see him again. Nice that he had the opportunity to be out and preaching too. I like that, but I'm sure he does. <laughs> All right, I think I better get to the Word of God. I'm taking up so much time just enjoying the, talking about our church family and the great fellowships that we have. Let's take a moment to pray. God, you know all of these things we've been talking about. Our folks and all the things they're going through, Lord, we do really sorrow with them and grieve with them, especially with the really difficult things. And God, you know that. And I know that you care too, very much, more than we ever do. Because you built these emotions into us. They're a part of what you are too. God, I ask you to bless in these situations we've just been talking about, those where we know there's a problem and those where we don't. I thank you for the few that are enjoying some time with family, but even there, there's concerns. And so I ask you, God, to work in these hearts, minds, bodies, medical situations, all of these things. I know you've got the answer for every single one of them. I just know that it, in your time and in your way, but I pray for you to help us to be patient. I pray for you to help each one of us to listen to what you would have us to do. 
Because oftentimes there's things that we need to learn or see, we need to, to take some action our, in our own life to take care of part of the problem. And, the, and, then you need, and then you'll fulfill exactly what you've promised. So God, give us wisdom. Help us to know your will for what we should be doing each day. Give us also the eyesight that we need to see your blessings, to see your work in our life, and to give you praise and glory for who you are, for what you're doing. Help us not to be so self-centered that we don't recognize your blessings. Father, as I think about today, I thank you for the chance just to be here and to gather with these people to look forward to talking about the Word of God and what you have for us. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will move throughout this time. Help us to be drawn closer to you, to learn from you things that will be helpful to us as we go on through the week. And then, too, to just give you glory and honor and praise in the things that we're learning and teaching and, and, and expressing. Thank you, God, for who you are, for all that you do for us, and most of all, just for your love for us that motivates all the rest of this. Thank you, God, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, as most of you know, we've been doing a study through the book of Romans, and it starts out in a way that we, some of us find kind of uh, almost depressing, in the sense that he's saying, starts out in the first two chapters and third, talking about how everyone, every human being is a sinner from birth. That that's the nature that we're born with. You see, Paul has to make sure these new Christians understand where they're coming from. That we need a Savior because of our sin. And then he was on to talk about salvation, about Jesus Christ as Savior and how he provided a way of salvation, a way we can be right with God, even though we are sinners, how we can have that sin forgiven and be right with God. And in the part we're looking at now in Romans chapter 3, he's explaining how that comes about. And he's explaining that it isn't a matter of us being good, being good enough to be right with God in God's eyes. Because he said, has said back in the earlier part of this, ver of this chapter, and in fact back in chapter 2 also, that nobody is good enough. Because God's standard is holiness. No sin. And none of us can meet that. So he says there has to be another way. And there is. That God provided another way. By coming to Christ and asking his forgiveness based on his death on the cross to pay for our sins. He says that way, anybody can come to Christ. Anyone can be forgiven and become a child of God and be guaranteed a place in heaven. He says, but you can't do it any other way. He says, if you try to do it your own way, <coughs> instead of God's way, he doesn't accept that. God doesn't accept your way. I remember so many times hearing people talking about how to be right with God, and they have all their ideas, and most of them usually come up with something like being, being good in the sense that I do more good than I do bad. Um, in whose opinion? Because what God says is no sin at all. Um, so you're never going to reach that one. You're never going to be that good. And then a lot of them, they think, one of the descriptions I hear so often is people say that when I get to heaven and stand before God in judgment, he's going to take a big set of scales and put all my bad deeds here and all my good deeds here. And if there's more good deeds than there are bad, I'm okay. The Bible doesn't ever say that. It says quite the opposite. It says that it only takes one sin to make you a sinner. And every one of us falls into that category. Um, most of us love verse uh, 23. 
as the best expression of that, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's in the part we're going to be reading today in just a few moments. He says very simply, you, if you are trusting in your own good works, you're not going to do it. Now, I, there are other things that people put their trust in or their faith in to get them to heaven. Some, you'll, I know you'll have heard this one, there are several churches that teach, you just have to be a member of this church. That's all it takes. Or, you just have to be baptized as a young child. Or, lots of other things. There is a church, that there is a religion, not a church, I wouldn't call it that, I guess. A religion that teaches that in order to be saved, let me see, there are seven things that you have to do. But the last one is you have to make a pilgrimage to a particular place in the world, and there is a temple there where you go up the 100 and some steps on your knees. And that's the last of the uh, things you're supposed to do. And that'll make you right with God. No. And, and, you, and you, I'm sure you've all heard other ideas too. Oh, of course, what I think a whole lot of people seem to think, at least some of these you hear about, is that if you give lots of money to the church, that'll do it. No, that won't do it. The only thing that does it is you as a person personal relationship with Christ, you praying and asking Jesus to forgive your sins based on your faith in him, your trust in him as the Savior. And he'll, he will. That he guarantees that if anyone sincerely comes to him with that request. But let's get to the scripture itself and how Paul is explaining it. Now remember who this guy is that's writing this. Paul, as he's led by God to write it, is... A lawyer, trained as a lawyer. He's actually a great missionary at this point, but he was trained as a lawyer. And so he comes at everything from a kind of a lawyer's background. He makes it, he, his arguments are very, very thorough. That's why it's taken him three chapters already to get to this point in explaining this whole idea. Verse 21. Well, actually, I think I should probably start a little earlier. Let's go back to verse 19. That's part of our what we were reading last week, but I want to include it because it kind of introduces this next section. Now, we know that whatsoever things the law saith, the law of God, like it was given in the Old Testament, it saith to them who are under the law, that every in the mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by the works, by doing good deeds, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Nobody. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. He says that was the purpose of the law, to prove to you, to make it plain that you are a sinner, that you're not worthy of heaven by yourself. But now, verse 21 but now the righteousness of God without the law or outside of the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember, he'd been talking to the Jewish believers just a few chapters earlier, or a few verses earlier. He, and the Jewish people, of course, had a great faith that being Jew, being of the Jewish nation, meant that they were God's special people. And so they had a kind of an in with God. He says, there's no difference as far as salvation. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference in this very simple fact that you're still all sinners and you all have to come to Christ the same way. Let's go on from there. Verse 24. Well, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption 
that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a a propitiation. One of those good words. To be a propitiation. Do you know what that means, by the way? What a propitiation is? A substitute who takes your punishment for you or takes some debt for you. So a propitiation is just your substitute. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, Christ's blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. This is God's forbearance, God's willingness to be patient and forgive you based on Christ's death on the cross to pay for your sins. It's already taken place. He says, so I'm going to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, God's righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You see, one of the arguments people love to use, I'm going to interrupt my reading for a moment to make this comment. One of the arguments, you know, theologians love to argue about anything they can. And one of the arguments that people oftentimes have used to say that justification, being right with God, based on just on believing that Jesus was the Messiah, doesn't make sense. Because you're still a sinner. So so how can a just God accept you? Well, of course, that is covered by the fact that Christ is the propitiation, the substitute that took our punishment. So he says, he is both, God is both just and he is the one that justified us through Christ. Both just and our justifier of them which believe in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Says, do we get a chance to boast about being right with God, being one of God's chosen people? No. <laughs> boasting is it says it is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith says if you were saved by being good, well then you'd have something to brag about, I guess. Bring, brag about how, what a great person you were. says, but that ain't the way it works. Being a really good person probably a good thing, but that isn't what gets you saved. So he says you don't get to brag about being right in God's eyes. He says that comes because you trusted him. That comes based on faith, not on works, not on anything that you do. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. (laughs) There just ain't any. By what law of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He says being good doesn't have anything to do with your justification. Now, I've got to make an interruption there because I, before I read the rest, I want to add good works, doing right things, doing what God wants you to do, isn't how you get saved. But it is what's expected of you after you're saved by God. I love where Galatians tells us, for ye are saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it goes on to say, that you are saved unto good works, which God has for, for ordained for you. It says, once you're saved, you are expected to be doing what God wants you to do. You are expected to be a good person. And there are rewards for it. It says, but that's not what gets you saved. What gets you saved is simply your faith in Christ, that he is the Messiah that God promised then we get to verse 29. And he kind of goes back to that controversy that was in the Corinthian church and in the Roman church both. In fact, probably in most of the churches of that day. About, are the Jews better than the Gentiles? Are they special? And you'll 
probably remember that early in this chapter, he says, well, they're special in one way, because it was through the Jews that God gave his word to the world. He says, but that's the only way that they're special from everybody else. So look at verse 29 and 30. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yeah, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, the Jewish people, by faith, and the uncircumcision, through faith, same way. <laughs> he says he's still the same God, and he's going to deal with all of the human race in the same way. The Jews had a special place in that they had a part in God's plan, which was to be used by him to give the word of God to the world. And through the Jewish race, the Messiah himself came. God in human form as a Jewish man. But, that didn't change anything as far as how a person saved. Jew, Gentile, both sinners under God, both saved the same way, by faith in Christ. So here he's gotten around to saying very simply that I don't care what way you try to come to God, if you don't come to him by faith in Christ, you don't get there. It's that simple. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because that's all there is to it. He says you can think about all these other things, and they're probably fun to argue about and all that, they don't have a thing to do with actually making a person right with God. Allowing us to become a child of God with the promise of forgiveness of sins. That's what we call salvation. And of a guarantee of a home in heaven. Don't you love the verses in John chapter 14 where Jesus told the disciples that I, that in my father's House are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I like that. It feels a little bit sarcastic. <laughs> but then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where is Jesus now? Since his resurrection, up in heaven. Sitting at the right hand of God, I like the verse that tells us that he is there interceding for you and me. And he says, when the time comes, we'll be there with him. When your time comes, when my time comes. When's that going to be? Who knows? Of course, I think of the rapture, but of course it also applies to our, the moment of our physical death. If I were to drop dead here 10 minutes from now, I'd be in heaven with him. Don't you love the verse that says, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just that instantaneously. So if I did, or if that happens 20 years from now, <laughs> whenever, I know where I'll be. I'll be with God. I'll be with Christ. Now, I hope that's true of all of you, that you know that. If you don't know it, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> or talk to any of our guys. Any of our people that know the word of God well. Because you need to get that settled. Quite simply. But. Here. Paul is telling these Roman Christians. And those people who were. May not have yet been Christians. But were interested in the, that way. Which is what it was called back then. They didn't even call them Christians yet. They are in Rome. They were just called the people of the way. And. He was saying to them, you need to know, first of all, about how to be right with God. One of the things you'll find as you look through the New Testament, there's a lot of different times where you see teaching and preaching by various disciples and apostles. You'll find that they almost all concentrate primarily on a very simple set of events. Crucifixion, burial, resurrection. He says, this is the gospel. That Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. 
as the scriptures said. I love the way Paul writes that. <laughs> he says, according to the scriptures. Then he says, and then he was married. And then he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. He says, just like it was prophesied. He says, that's the most important thing you have to know. Have to understand, have to believe. He says, because once you've got that clearly in your heart, not just in your mind, then that where salvation comes in. When you ask Jesus Christ, based on what he did for you, to be your Savior. He says, after that, there's a whole lot more. And then he goes on, of course, to talk about living for the Lord and how God expects us to live. That's what the rest of Romans is about. But he says, you've got to get this right first. Otherwise, he says, all the rest is a waste. That's what he's talking about with the law. He says, yeah, the Ten Commandments and the other laws that the Jewish people were given, they were important. But he says their purpose was to show you that you needed a Savior, that you weren't good enough by yourself. There, of course, in our adult Sunday school class, before the services each morning, we're looking at the end times, at what's going to happen when the rapture comes and then Christ, then the tribulation and then Christ coming back to set up his kingdom. And there's so many different things that you really get into there. But one of them that we're going to see, I was thinking next week, but it probably won't be. It'll probably be two or three weeks down the road <laughs> before we actually get to that passage. But one of them talks about a parable that I'm sure you guys have all heard. And that's where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. He says that at the end of uh, at the final judgment, that the angels will come forward and separate the people. And he describes it like a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. And it talks about them being judged according to how they have treated the people around them. Now, I have seen and heard pastors saying, see, it's talking about them being judged according to their works. And so then they go on to teach that if you're a good person, you can be saved by your works. No, that's not what it's talking about. Because where this comes in is that, if you remember Revelation, the great white throne judgment, it says very simply that that is really two judgments in one. Because it says in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about how the books were opened, which were the books that contained all the information about their lives, how they lived their life. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And it says, and they are judged out of the books by their works. And then it says, and then the book of life was opened. And if their name was not written in the book of life, they were cast into hell. You see, what that first judgment does is to look at their life and the way they live their life and what it does is prove to them their life doesn't make them worth going to heaven. Their life makes them a sinner. And then the book of life is the record of those who have asked Jesus Christ to be their Savior. And if their name is not there, they're cast into hell. That's where this judgment of the sheep and the goats that Christ talks about comes in. That's the first part of that great white throne judgment. How they lived their life. Was it good enough to get them to heaven? And of course, not every single person judged by that basis is condemned. Remember back here earlier in Romans, we looked at, I just read, of course, the verses about all have sinned, but before that, way back in not actually way back, back to verse 9 in the same chapter. What then? Are we better than they? No. Or in all, no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And then he goes on to say how terrible everybody is in God's eyes as far as the fact that they are sinners. They are all gone out of the way. They are together, become unprofitable. There is none 
that doeth good. No, not one. And then he has a lot more to say about them. But the very simple fact he's saying is, if you're trusting in how good you are, this says nobody's good enough. That's not the way to heaven. The way to heaven is trust, faith in Christ, that he is the promised Messiah that God sent. So this whole chapter three, God is saying very simply, Paul is saying, as God led him to write it, but he is quoting from scripture after scripture, where God told that so simply that don't trust in anything other than Christ, or it's a waste. There is only one way. Remember back in, um, again, I quoted a little bit out of John 14. Uh, and a couple of verses later, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He says, that's the only way that works. I guess I would say there's two ways to think about that right now. For those of you who have already asked Christ to be your Savior, it's a reminder that all of these people around us that haven't need to know. Our families, our friends, neighbors, whoever. We need to be witnesses just of how great God is and what he has done for us. And if there is anybody here who hasn't ever asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, that message is plain too. You need him. And so you need to take care of it. None of us know the time. None of us know how much longer we got. I, <laughs> I was just, most of you know my great-granddaughter Phoebe out there, nine years old. She asked me if, just earlier this morning, um, we had talked about a death, and she was saying, that everybody dies, yeah. I says, I'm someday I'm going to die. Someday you're going to die. That's the way it is, unless Christ comes back first and takes us all home. Um, but I don't know if it's going to be sometime soon, or 20 years from now, or whatever. And I don't know that for me or for anybody else either. I don't care what your age is. That isn't really the deciding factor, <laughs> as we all know. Um, and she got the, uh, she understood that it means simply that our lives are, I, oh, the Bible uses so many different illustrations. They're like the grass that grows up and fades away and like flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow and a lot of other illustrations, doesn't it? We don't know time. That's in God's hands. What we do know is that we need to be right with the Lord. No matter what time it is right now, whether you're <laughs> old, just barely old enough to understand the idea of salvation, or whether you're, um, is there anybody here older than me right now? There might be. <laughs> I'll use my age, 75, or older. It don't matter. You need to be ready to be right with the Lord and then be ready because you never know what the time is. I got to quit. My time's way gone, according to that clock. Let's stop. But just keep in mind, the Lord God has provided a way of salvation that is so incredible, free to us, free to the, for the asking. But it sure wasn't free in God's eyes. He paid the price for us. He's a wonderful God. So much beyond what we imagine sometimes. Love that great and that incredible and that everlasting. I am very thankful for the Lord that we have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, I really don't know just how to say thank you appropriately. Because you provided a way of salvation that we can all take advantage of. You gave us the opportunity, but you also gave us the right, the ability to choose. And you left it in our hands. Father, thank you for being a loving God. Thank you for this great group of people that are here this morning to hear your word, for the opportunities you give us just to simply 
come together and rejoice in who and what you are. I ask that everybody here, myself included, obviously, Lord, will be strengthened and built up by you to be the kind of person you want us to be. I ask you to bless us with whatever we particularly need this day, each one of us. Each of us is going through different things. We are, not one of us is the same. You make us each different. And I'm grateful for that. I'm glad that we're all individuals and that every one of us is different. But Lord, that means you deal with each of us differently. And we each face different trials and troubles uh, throughout the day. So I ask you to help us. Whatever is coming up in our lives this day, this week, in the time ahead, guide us to be and to do what you would want us to. Please, in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, folks. Jesus was showing us a way forward. It was something he already knew about. Let me regress for a minute and tell you a tale. This week, I probably got the biggest, meanest raccoon in my trap that I ever got. He filled up the entire thing and I had to drag that cage over to the driveway to get it out of there. So my brother, who I hardly ever get to see unless it's a funeral, came up for no funeral this time. And he's a big Harley biker dude. Take that picture in your head. So he pulls in my driveway to visit and I go, can you help me do something? He goes, yeah, sure, Mayor. Now he's like this tall and I'm this tall. I go, so I'm going to load this. I got this already loaded in the truck. Can you just go for a drive with me? All you got to do is hold a stick and open a door open. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, I got this raccoon I got to go get rid of. I don't kill them. I just relocate them to a finer place than my, my bird feeder. And um, so I have a leather glove because on um, because he's a mean one. He's real mean. He's not happy. And... I said to my husband that night, I go, I just didn't understand it. The look on his face was like, and he said something dumb like, is it going to bite me? And, and I already knew that I had to drag this cage, take it for a drive long enough far away that he couldn't find his way back to my bird feeder and open that door and he would leave. He wasn't going to bite me. He was mad because he was shoved in that little cage and he was going to be gone. But my brother didn't know that. And I'm thinking, I'm just assuming everybody's moved raccoons from their backyard because I consistently have to do it. And I want to feed the birds, so I am going to put the food in that bird feeder and just fight with the raccoons. God's word is something that's gone before us. It's something that's set. It's something that, that is already proven. He didn't know. I already knew. We don't know, that's why we go to the Word. We don't know the promises he has for us and the good things he has for us. That's why we trust in what Jesus is saying. There is none like Jesus. No one else has done what he's done, no one. So if you are feeling insecure about that, just go back to that fact. This is, I, I don't understand this. He didn't understand holding the stick so I could get the door open long enough for that little booger to get out, right? But Jesus understands what's ahead of us. And there is none like him. And when we don't understand something and we're a little nervous that we might get bit by this one, trust Jesus, right? Amen? There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Amen. Let's sing it again. There is none like you. No one else could touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is no other like you. Amen. Uh, God, it is so great. Almighty, all powerful, all knowing, but also a loving God who cares about each one of us. 
Father, I am so grateful for your love, for your grace and mercy. I just pray as we leave here today that you will bless every single thing that is taking place in our life. I look forward to the Board of Elders meeting in a few minutes, and I ask your blessing on that. But I ask your blessing on whatever is going to be happening in the lives of each of us as we go forward. In Christ's name, amen.